Uh, as Dean of the Case Western Reserve School of Law, it gives me great pleasure to welcome everybody this morning to this exciting symposium. Let me say just a word about the Center for Law, Technology, and the Arts, which is a very important and strong part of our enterprise here at the law school. Um, the, law, the center is uh, really, I think, fairly said, internationally recognized forum for the interdisciplinary focus on law, technology, uh, and the arts. And it was founded, or inspired by, I guess I should say, a fairly basic concept, that concept being that there ought to be linkage and relationship between the law and human creativity in, in the variety of forms that the name of the center uh, calls, into, calls into mind and into question. And the legal system, and those of us who are lawyers, I think have some, some responsibility or opportunity, if you want to think of it that way, to be certain that our, that our legal system keeps pace with technological creativity and artistic create creativity as, as it moves forward. And it is those kinds of questions that surround that broad topic that our center focuses upon. And indeed, that is what this, uh, this uh, symposium uh, is designed to focus upon as well. So with that, with that having been said, and with uh, a great uh, uh, confidence in, in our center and so forth, I am pleased to turn the session over to Michael Scharf, who heads not, was not only involved with this center, but also heads our, our international center, the Cox International Center, who will start to kick off the program. Michael. Well, Jackie and I often collaborate in our work. Um, she is the associate director of the Cox Center as well as um, the co-director of the Law, Technology, and the Arts Center. So it was very kind of her to invite me to say a few words about the internationalization of today's conference and how it fits in with some of the other centers that we have at the law school. Um, this law school is unique in that it has a number of cutting edge and very highly respected centers. And among those is the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center, which is supported by about a $4 million endowment and does a lot of active uh, projects and conferences. The centers, though, all work together synergistically. We work very hard not to have a silo effect. And so on a conference like this, there is a lot of interaction and cooperation. Um, for example, Craig Nard, who is the director of the Law, Technology, and the Arts Center, teaches a course on international IP law. So international law is really at the heart of uh, the intellectual property endeavor at the law school. Uh, Jackie, who I mentioned, is um, not only working with the Law, Technology, and the Arts Center, but she is the associate director of the Cox Center. And when she teaches cyber law, which is one of her main courses, she does it with an international and comparative law focus. We're most happy, though, that two years ago, uh, all the centers got together and created a really novel entity, which is the Joint Cyberspace Law and Policy Office. And this is an office that spans many of the different centers. It is being co-directed by Jackie and Ray, Ku, who's behind me. And um, it has done a number of uh, major activities and conferences, including at the American Society of International Law. But this is its first major conference here at the law school. And so it's its, it's kickoff conference. Um, I want to also focus your attention on some of the international aspects of this conference. Uh, for example, Thursday's keynote yesterday by Daniel Jervis was about the international aspects of intellectual property law. And today's keynote by Jeff Samuels is about issues in international domain name governance. We also have among many speakers who will be talking about international aspects of this topic, Ilian Lees, whose presentation will be about comparative perspectives, focusing on Korea. And also Carl Averbach, who is the former director of ICANN, is joined on one of the panels with Christine Height Farley, who is a consultant at the World Intellectual Property Organization and ICANN. So um, it is a great pleasure for me to celebrate the international aspects of this conference and to be a joint sponsor of it. And now I turn it over to Jackie. Thank you. I'm going to do all the thank yous now. I'm not going to do anything really substantive. But uh, as Michael said, this conference has really been an attempt to draw together the work of a lot of our different centres. So instead of having a 
silo effect, which we don't want to have. Uh, we've had involvement, obviously, from the Cox Centre, uh, the Centre for Business Law and Regulation, and SISTA, the, the uh, Conflict Resolution Centre. And in fact, Iliang Lee, who will be speaking later, first came to our attention through a, a SISTA program last year where he came to talk about international domain name uh, dispute resolution issues. So this has been a great opportunity to sort of put together a lot of our expertise at the law school in a lot of these different areas. Before I lead off with the first panel of what I think will be a really exciting and stimulating day, uh, I'd like to again thank the speakers for participating. I thank the people who were here last night, but not everyone was here last night, so I wanted to extend my thanks to everyone for coming here in the fall. A lot of people said to me, Cleveland in the fall, I don't know about that, but they came anyway, so, so that's been great. Um, the people without whom we couldn't do anything, and I don't see them in this room, are basically Nancy Pratt and Alice Simon, who you will have met outside. They make all the trains run. They do a terrific job, and I'd very much like to thank them for all the work they've done on this conference. I don't even really have to be here. Everything just seems to happen. I'd also like to thank the, the student volunteers, um, who some of whom are here. Michael and Tracy are here. We also have uh, Kelly, Peter, and Boris, and I think James will be doing the mic running and the timekeeping today. And they're, they're not getting paid, but they're doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. So I, I really do thank them very much for that. Um, I'd like to thank my co-directors in the Law Technology and the Arts Centre, Ray Koo behind me, and Craig Nard, who was here yesterday and really founded the centre and made it possible for us to do all of this terrific programming. I'm sure I'm leaving someone out and I didn't make notes, so I think at this point, it being nine o'clock, oh, that's, that's who I wanted to thank. I wanted to thank all my colleagues who are not in the centres who have agreed to participate today. Uh, John Gretzinger, Irina Manta, Cassandra Robertson, our uh, sorely missed ex-colleague Fumi Arewa, who's going to be speaking later today. It's just been terrific to have everyone participating in this way. So. Without further ado, I'm going to turn over to John Gretzinger, who is going to chair the first panel. Thanks, John. Thank you, Jackie. This panel is uh, regarding domain names, privacy, and free speech. And uh, we know that every website is basically comprised of two basic components. Domain name, which gets you to the website, and then the content. And it's clear that <clears throat> content on the website has had an impact on our rights of privacy and free speech, whether it's an employee, a former employee who has some negative things to say about a, his former employer, or um, you know, whether, whether it's uh, someone anywhere in the world who can find out much about you without your consent or knowledge. But how in the world do we relate domain names to privacy and free speech. That is what we're going to be discussing today, and we have three experts um, in reverse order. Corinne McSherry uh, is senior staff attorney and Kaylee Promise Fellow at the Electronic Found, uh, Frontier Foundation. Who uh, She specializes in intellectual property and free speech litigation and is involved in much copyright misuse uh, cases. She will be discussing some of those cases um, as our last speaker. She's been, uh, she has appeared on radio and television from CNN to the Boston Globe, the LA Times, and the Wall Street Journal. David Feuer. David is acting director of the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic. A uh, intellectual property and technology lawyer, uh, David previously practiced um, with national firms in both British Columbia and Ontario. Uh, he has an LLM from the University of Toronto and has wrought, uh, written extensively and is a frequent commentator uh, in the media. And finally, our own uh, Professor Raymond Koo. Uh, Ray is a nationally known expert in the field of copyright law and internet law. He wrote really the first book on cyber law. Um, prior to joining us here, he was uh, a visiting professor at Cornell, my alma mater, as well as um, at uh, Seton Hall and uh, Thomas Jefferson School of Law. A cum laude graduate of New York University 
and uh, an undergrad at Brown University. I'm delighted to turn the panel over to Ray. Hi, good morning everyone and uh, thank you for coming here at 9 a.m. Uh, to listen to the talks. Uh, I wanted to say first of all thank you to Jackie for organizing this wonderful conference and as, as John's introduction pointed out, I, I'm kind of an interloper here. I'm not really a trademark person uh, and you'll see as a, you'll see quite clearly from the talk that I, I am not going to pretend to be a trademark person either in this process. Uh, as, as the title of, of the talk is, uh, suggests, it's uh, of two minds. Uh, I want to look at uh, what might be seen as a conflict between trademark and free speech principles, uh, not from a more traditional doctrinal perspective, but what I would like to suggest is a really kind of differing, perhaps, assumptions about human behavior and how we make decisions, and in particular about uh, how individuals or how we should actually consider individuals as decision makers. Uh, so I want to start by giving a couple of examples here. I didn't, I didn't pick Exxon for any particular reason, it just came to mind more quickly than, than some other companies. Uh, but clearly in the trademark context, right, you have a company uh, that, that does want to preserve and protect its name its, as a, an important source of product and services. Uh, and so initially what we, we want is to think quite clearly of Exxon as being part of ExxonMobil and its formal corporate identity. Uh, of course, the corporation has other interests as well, which, uh, which is uh, initially, well, we want it to be associated with the product and services they provide. So for Exxon, they, we want it to be, uh, they want us to think about energy technology, gasoline, plastics. Uh, there is also a kind of secondary level of issues that they would like us to consider, right? And that, of course, uh, would be that they're committed to the environment, uh, that uh, they care about education and fund educational programs, right? that they are participants in worldwide giving, uh, all adding to the kind of good faith and uh, important uh, positive positive aspects of the corporation and its identity as a member of the global community. Uh, of course, those aren't the only things we would tend to associate with, with Exxon, uh, or any other company for that matter. And of course, there'll be others that want to be associated as well. And obviously, those would be the competitors here, right? And so uh, whether it's more direct competitors like uh, B British Petroleum uh, or Texaco, or kind of more modern or recent competitors, so clean coal, uh, those any of you who drive through Pennsylvania will recognize signs of this sort uh, in terms of Pennsylvania's coal industry promoting their clean coal products as an alternative uh, source of energy, and of course then the renewable energy uh, industries that are coming uh, much more aggressively to the fore today, right? And all of these businesses want to also similarly in many respects uh, be associated uh, when people and customers think of Exxon. Now, of course, those aren't the only groups, too, right? And so uh, in many respects, uh, I think as Corinne will talk more about later today, uh, critics will clearly also want to be associated in the same kind of cognitive space with Exxon. Uh, so whether it's about corporate greed and the idea that Exxon was making record profits in a time when uh, people felt pressured at the pump or references to the Exxon Valdez and <clears throat> the kind of Exxon's treatment of the environment uh, or fossil fuels and its contribution to global warming, all of these things are issues that ultimately get become very much tied into when we think of Exxon. What, what do people want to think about? And also similarly, what do people want others to think about? Now, <clears throat> If we switch it to other, not instead of trademark law and companies, right, but to issues, right, and so obviously I picked this because of the saliency right now, but the idea, should there be a public health care option, uh, we, we see actually a similar constellation of interests and concerns, right? So the proponents of a public health care option uh, would like us to think about the fact uh, that, you know, we have a, a very strong justification in terms of providing health care uh, to millions of Americans, that we, as the the United States, uh, in some respects, suffer from one of the worst infant mortality rates in, in the world. And of course, these are, these are things and issues we should uh, resolve. 
Uh, moreover, a public health care option, according to these proponents, will say will make society healthier, right? So, the, of course, the kids uh, and the fact that there are 47 million Americans currently uninsured. Now, in addition to that, right, there'll be other issues that will come up in more specific details, just like uh, the pricing and the products that a company will offer. Uh, is so, for example, that you know, well, our current plan has an opt-out option at least at the Senate level uh, that it might create competition of, among insurance providers and therefore uh, save lives and save money. Uh, it might also be associated with broader notions of morality and justice, right? That this is essentially in, in a wealthy society something that we should do. Uh, it may also take on the idea that, well, you know, corporate greed and the idea that uh, a lot of the industry that makes healthcare decisions uh, are doing it in a way that might accelerate their profits by denying healthcare is certainly part of what the, the proponents of a public health care option would like us to think about. Right now, obviously, that's not all, uh, and I, I apologize for the kind of sparsity of the com competitors under these circumstances. Uh, but clearly, one is the private model, right? Essentially, we're doing just fine. And I have, of course, my, uh, my health insurance company, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, up here, uh, as saying that, you know, in fact, the world is just fine as it is, and we're providing many people excellent health care benefits. Uh, or that, uh, as uh, the, the Republicans are proposing, the tort reform should be a serious part of any package along these lines. Uh, and again, in any discussion or thought about public health care or having a public Public option. Uh, we, the, the, these other competitors want these ideas to be associated with it, right? And then, of course, there are the much more uh, aggressive. Uh, criticisms that would be associated with it. And I apologize to our Canadian friends in the room. Uh, I, I don't mean to imply uh, that Canada's healthcare system is inferior to ours, but clearly in the rhetoric of American politics, it's often associated that way, right? So we, we're told that there'll be lines and rationing of healthcare, see Canada, uh, that uh, decisions will be made by government bureaucrats or that this is a form of socialism. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, even worse in some respects, right, we'll get essentially the outright lies and uh, gross, gross exaggerations, right? So uh, the horrible caricature of the president and uh, the hammer and sickle being associated with health care reform or the idea that health care proposals include death panels that would be recommending that we euthanize uh, grandma and grandpa when, they're, when the value to society uh, essentially diminishes. Uh, now, of course, this isn't the same. This isn't again isolated even to issues, right? So candidates and politicians and public figures are all subject to this as well. And uh, so Barack Obama and his people and his campaign uh, want us to think certain things and associate certain things with his identity. Uh, and of course, most clearly, it will be candidate Obama, uh, and at the very least, that he is a, a man, a family man, uh, and who uh, will bring those family values to our government. Uh, that he is a man of hope uh, and a kind of difference and an agent of change in our society. Of course, ideally, I, ideally, he would like to be associated with the concept of being president of the United States as a candidate, right? And now he has that association. Uh, now, but part of that, in order to make that association possible, he wants to put forward certain kind of uh, objective values uh, to convince us, right? And of course, the Harvard Law Review uh, aspect may only be interesting and compelling to the lawyers and law professors in the room. Uh, but, you know, the fact that he was a U.S. senator, that he's supposed to represent a post-partisan view on American politics, and certainly in many respects a post-racial view. Now, of course, again, like Exxon, like the health care options, uh, there are competitors here. Right? And so Hillary Clinton, clearly in the primary, uh, wants us to think not whenever you think of Barack Obama, you essentially want to think of Hillary Clinton as well. And actually, maybe Hillary Clinton as a more compelling uh, alternative to Barack Obama. And of course, in the presidential campaign, you have both uh, John McCain and Sarah Palin and Ron Paul uh, entering into this space. Right? They want to be associated uh, with Barack Obama or at the very ideally supplant uh, Barack Obama when we're starting to think of these issues. Now, of course, that also comes with the criticisms, right? So uh, whether he is inexperienced, uh, whether he's a liberal, uh, whether it's he's just essentially part of the machine of Chicago politics, uh, all, all of these aspects come up in the criticisms of Barack Obama. And if you wanted to do Google searches or other kind of flaw, any, any, any aspect of trying to connect to Barack Obama from one individual in the community, uh, all the critics, all the competitors, and his own people want us to have 
have all of these different associations uh, when we do that, right? And of course, even the, again, the more aggressive uh, criticisms as well. Now, ironically, or very interestingly, uh, when we're dealing with the trademark context, uh, trademark law is actually quite powerful right, as a tool for trademark owners. Uh, so while that whole cognitive space is rather quite cluttered in general, uh, in many respects, trademark law gives us the ability to perhaps eliminate some uh, uh, of those thoughts. Uh, maybe we can't eliminate all of them, right? Uh, it, it, many of them are ingrained in the public memory, but we can have some of those recede a little bit to the background. Uh, and certainly, in, in many respects, we can push some of them even off to the side, especially uh, the competitors. Uh, and what does that mean? That means in the end, what we have is actually a way for using law to kind of clear the space, right? To allow the company's message and the company's signal uh, to come across a little more clearly, right? And whether we're doing this online through concepts of initial interest confusion or the use uh, and essentially the prohibition on the sale of meta tags and advertising keywords or an expansive definition of commercial use with regard to websites that uh, share similar uh, domain names, uh, th this, th the, all these aspects of trademark law serve to kind of clear this cognitive space to essentially allow uh, the Marx owner to get their message across. Now, of course, uh, in terms of First Amendment law, right, uh, and using the candidate as an example here, uh, the law doesn't provide for any mechanisms of, of this sort, right? And whether we're talking about uh, free speech principles uh, governing defamation law or the idea that opinions essentially are unobjective, un 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 I'm sorry, uh, are not objective and therefore unverifiable and therefore we essentially have a very little regulation of opinion whatsoever, uh, or even the inflammatory comments are all part and parcel of our traditional First Amendment doctrine, right? In many respects, right, as the court has said in the past, you know, a function of free speech under our system of government is, in fact, to invite dispute. In fact, we, we think that we, our societies best serve when not only it produces conditions of unrest, but creates dissatisfaction uh, with conditions as they are, stirs people to anger, uh, and as the court said in New York Times versus Sullivan, this is all part of our commitment to a robust public debate. Right, so for us in the political sphere or outside of the trademark sphere, uh, we have to get through this clutter ourselves, right, and all of the competing messages. And law doesn't provide any mechanism in many respects uh, uh, to, to do that. Now, uh, Traditionally, the explanations have been threefold. Uh, one is that, well, trademarks are different, right? Their trademarks are property, and the property interests uh, under these circumstances uh, can be treated very differently than the speech problems that are raised. Uh, I would suggest that that's a possible and very useful explanation. I find it a little unsatisfying because, in some respects, it's conclusory, right? The idea that you have a property right uh, is already the conclusion that you have the ability and the legal uh, justification to control that result. And, you the same could be said about politics, right? That for a long time, criticism, sedition, is essentially the government's right uh, to not be criticized, right? Whether fairly or unfairly. Blasphemy, of course, was the same concept that the church and religious do doctrines and dogma had no uh, had a, had a special legal status and therefore couldn't be challenged uh, from a speech perspective. Uh, another aspect was that well, it's commercial, right? And so that commercial uh, use of marks and use of domain names really take them out of the realm of free speech protection. Uh, now, obviously, given what the Supreme Court has said about commercial speech in general, uh, that does seem to be a little inconsistent, right? That in the absence of a really clear, limited examples of false misrepresentation, uh, that really commercial speech in many of its guises, uh, aside from the objectively verifiable statements of price and quality, uh, really are entitled to the same First Amendment protection as a political speech, right, which uh, in the Virginia State Board case, of course, garnered a tremendous amount of criticism uh, from the dissenters saying, wait, we're, we're equating uh, shampoo with politics, right, and that somehow Americans care perhaps even more about shampoo and the price of shampoo than they do about who their, the next president of the United States will be. Uh, and then the last one, of course, is that about power, 
right, that, uh, and I think um, Corinne will do more about this later, that in many respects, this is a, this is a way of using law to preserve corporate interests uh, and protect economic interests. And uh, as we'll see, I, I will return to this uh, point a little later, uh, and, but I want, I want to hold off because I think there's another way to view and explain the differences uh, between the treatment of these problems here. Uh, and that is essentially that they represent and or at least very much have embedded in them uh, two views of human decision making. Uh, the first view, uh, I apologize to Matt Gronig uh, and uh, Cass Sunstein uh, in some respects, is the idea that you know, people are essentially homo Simpson, right? that uh, we are uh, essentially emotional, irrational, impulsive decision makers. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can take that from the example of P.T. Barnum, who might have said, well, we recognize this behavior, and therefore uh, there's a sucker born every minute, and we should be able to take advantage uh, of these suckers, or uh, perhaps in the best uh, positive spin on it that, well, we're essentially, as cognitive science is uh, pointing out to us now, uh, bounded rational. Right, there, there are limits uh, to our rational decision making, uh, uh, though the heuristics and the judgments we make are subject to certain limitations and flaws uh, that may or not, may not be subject to correction by law. And, and so uh, whether it's framing, uh, whether it's anchoring the salience bias, I mean, clearly trademark owners are trying to use these and responding to these concerns and saying, we need to clear this space, right? Uh, the same way political candidates know that a uh, framing of an issue is so fundamental to how uh, people who are introduced to the issue will subsequently deal with the problem or evaluate it, uh, you know, first in time will essentially uh, go a long way to influencing the decisions people will make. Uh, similarly, status quo bias will uh, have a, an important role in what's occurring in people's decision-making processes, right? So we, corporations, we want people to actually have uh, a really strong commitment to our company, our product, our brand, uh, because they're less likely to switch under those circumstances. In the same way, we recognize that, boy, you know, when you have healthcare and it's pretty good, uh, it's hard and it's frightening for some people to actually consider that there might be changes to this. Uh, and, and so in some respects, trademark law is recognizing uh, at the very least, if not taking advantage uh, of uh, some of these flaws in human decision making. Uh, of course, on the flip side, in free speech, we actually have a quite dramatically, uh, uh, in some respects, diametrically opposed view of human behavior here, and that is that we are essentially the rational economic actor of homo economicus here. Right? And uh, uh, so Justice Holmes uh, is up on the board as one of the prime examples, as well as, you know, I tend to think that uh, Justice Scalia as the kind of modern day version of Justice Holmes along these lines, right? And based on that model, we have been told, right, that the primary view of free speech is essentially one of the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and in that marketplace, it's essentially a you know, no-holds-bar game of competition of ideas. And of course, eventually, the, the best ideas will win in that marketplace. Uh, more recently, Justice Scalia very much uh, emphasized the assumptions about human rationality built into First Amendment law in his uh, concurrence in the McConnell versus FEC case, uh, where he said, quite, uh, for me, quite compellingly, uh, and quite interestingly, that the premise of our First Amendment is that the American people are neither sheep nor fools. Uh, if that premise is wrong, our democracy has a much greater problem to overcome than merely the influences of amassed wealth. And so that for the First Amendment has to assume uh, that people are rational, reasonable, and will make proper decisions. Uh, now, how, what can we do about this? Because clearly, there is a conflict here. Uh, and I think for my, many of us, uh, the idea that we resolve this conflict by essentially saying, well, all people are homo Simpson uh, is probably just a non-starter from the get-go, right? We, we know that is a gross exaggeration of human decision making. Uh, one possibility is to say that, well, if to, in order to reconcile these two conflicting views, uh, the First Amendment view should prevail and that essentially we treat all individuals as rational, reasonable uh, human actors that are capable of evaluating the costs and benefits of their decisions both in the short term and in the long term. Uh, and that would do go a long way to kind of reconciling uh, the two areas of law. Uh, personally, I find that also a little unsatisfactory uh, to the extent that what you care about is not 
short, uh, not just long-term success and progress in society, but immediate uh, correct and accurate decisions either about consumer preferences uh, or about political choices. Uh, because in, the, in many respects, the, the, the rational model of free speech essentially allows society to progress and reach the right conclusions over a longer period of time, closer to the Scottish Enlightenment view of progress, uh, and perhaps not quite as consistently with the French Enlightenment view, is essentially we want justice now. We want justice in this product decision. We want justice in this election. Uh, we want justice for these candidates and these constituents. Uh, there is, of course, another view, which is probably more, much more consistent with the way we actually all decide. Uh, and, and that is essentially that we're, we're, we are truly bounded rational, uh, boundedly rational. Uh, and that would require us to think of of law as, as Cass Sunstein has argued and nudge as a way of potentially nudging people and clearing some of the way uh, for people to make the decisions that they want to make. Now, uh, is there a source of authority for that even within the First Amendment? I would suggest that Justice Brandeis's conception of free speech uh, that he articulated in Whitney, Calif Whitney versus California may very well give us an entry into that, right? His, uh, for those of you who don't remember, his view was quite famously not the marketplace of ideas necessarily, right, but the importance of free speech as a matter of self-fulfillment uh, in which he suggested that the two main problems, uh, for example, were that uh, in older days men feared witches and then burned women, right? So essentially our emotional fears and concerns and uh, essentially overcame uh, what should have been our more rational reasoned judgment. Uh, and in the same way he argued that the greatest threat to freedom in a free society is essentially an inert public, right? Or a public that is not actually exercising uh, their, their cognitive reasoning and their judgment. Uh, and so perhaps there is a way to kind of reconcile these two and reconcile free speech law to the concept that we are seeing that human beings are a lot more complicated uh, than the simple assumptions that people have made about it, and certainly the assumptions that are currently embedded in our First Amendment law. Now, of course, what does that exactly, what that will look like I, is way beyond the, uh, the talk today, and it is, in fact, part of a much larger project. So thank you very much. So how do I make it go? Oh, okay. oh it just wasn't double clicking. These darn apples. All right, so I'm gonna, my name is David Fuhr. I'm the, I'm the director of uh, the Samuel Singlushko Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic at the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. And I'm gonna talk about uh, a pretty focused issue. Who is in privacy and, and not just uh, kind of privacy in general, the value of privacy in general, and how that intersects who is, but a specific problem, the problem of anonymity, uh, and why we want to preserve some space for that in, uh, uh, in respect of what kind of information who is publishes. So a little bit about uh, the clinic in the University of Ottawa. Uh, first of all, um, the clinic is fairly unique. We are a technology law clinic, the only one of its kind in Canada. There are others in the United States. Uh, that are somewhat like us, but they don't have the same mandate as our clinic. We do public education material, so our website is full of FAQs and, and, and publications uh, about the various projects we're working on that we, uh, we, we get out there with a view to help educate the Canadian public on these issues. There aren't, uh, in our view, uh, great sources for this kind of information in Canada. Uh, second, we're public interest advocates, so somewhat similar to what the EFF uh, and uh, some, you know, CDT, those kinds of organizations um, here in the United States who get out and invo involve ourselves in, in uh, uh, I guess, uh, debates over technology policy uh, in Canada. Um, no other organizations like ourselves uh, kind of take that upon themselves as their mandate uh, in Canada anyways. And then third, uh, we're a legal clinic. Students take, uh, take the clinic uh, for credit uh, or as a summer internship. We take on clients and assist them in, uh, with their problems. Sometimes it's pretty minor issues, you know, having difficulty with a, uh, you know, an internet service provider's bill. Um, uh, but there's got to be some kind of underlying public uh, interest component to it uh, before we'll get involved. So it can't just be a one-off issue with this bill. 
has to be a problem kind of endemic to the industry or endemic to a, a significant supplier. So it's an interesting mix. Uh, as, you know, I guess the one thing I would advise uh, you know, a university thinking about doing a clinic is, is not to do this particular model. It's a little bit too much. You know, we're all, we're all things technology to all, uh, all people in the north. Um, but it's interesting and it's, and it's fun. Uh, one of the areas where, uh, you know, one of the areas where we spend quite a bit of time is on, uh, is on privacy. Probably a third of the work at the clinic is focused on privacy and uh, we're, I guess, uh, we're enabled uh, in that work by the peculiar legislative uh, environment that we operate in in Canada. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But let's get back to who is. The problem that I want to focus on is the mandatory, mandatory disclosure of personal information. If you think about who is, it's, it, it, it was designed almost to function in a completely transparent fashion. Whose website is this? Well, you can go and find out who registered it and get contact information about, uh, you know, about that website. Now, what this does, uh, in practice is it dissolves anonymity. Now, you know, part of the answer to that may be, well, who cares? You get transparency as, as the benefit, and if we have to do trade-offs, uh, as we have to in many, uh, many policy areas, that's not a bad trade-off. And there's some, just some validity to that. However, the problem, in my view, is the peculiar value uh, <clears throat> that attaches to anonymity. I mean, one of the things I love about speaking in the United States is I get to reach into U.S. case law on, uh, on, uh, on the First Amendment. Canadian case law and freedom of expression tends to read like it's the product, the negotiated product of a royal commission. Um, and if you've ever <laughs> encountered a royal commission, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But looking at uh, McIntyre and Ohio Elections Commission, I mean, and this is one of the best statements of the value of anonymity to a democracy, right? It's a shield from the tyranny of the majority. It thus exemplifies the purpose behind the Bill of Rights and of the First Amendment in particular to protect unpopular individuals from retaliation and their ideas from suppression at the hand of an intolerant society. That's it, right? That's the value that we're trying to protect here. And our challenge on who is, uh, in Canada in particular, is have we achieved the right balance? Now, let's take a look at, at CIRA. CIRA is .ca, right? This is the Canadian Internet Registration Authority. I'm sure most of you have never had cause to uh, inquire into the existence of such an organization, but I trust you it's there. It is a private corporation. It is non-profit, but nonetheless engaged in commercial activity. Now, WHOIS has gone through a series of policies. The old WHOIS policy is one that uh, I would suggest is probably familiar uh, you know, to you. It's, it's what, the, what uh, WHOIS was originally modeled on, this uh, you know, complete transparency, uh, no, um, no mind turned to, uh, I guess, the, 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 the free speech issues um, embodied uh, in anonymity principles, uh, and certainly not mindful of some of the other problems associated uh, with, uh, with publication of such data, things like you know, spam mining and whatnot, that I'm not going to go into, but are kind of peripheral privacy issues associated with, with who is. Now, in, you know, and let's keep in mind where this old policy came from. Uh, you know, people in this room, I'm sure, you know, can, can speak to this. Uh, uh, much better than, than I can, but I understood that it was really an administrative issue, right? So when there's a problem with a website or with a domain, that the contact information was there and it could be handled on a, you know, technologically on the, on the back end. It was really all about administration. It wasn't intended uh, as, you know, a directory, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a published directory, uh, you know, the, the encyclopedia of who owns what on the internet. So, with this, uh, with this uh, blanket policy of publication and no transparency, uh, problems emerged over time as more and more people jumped onto the internet and began to, you know, raise some of these other concerns that we've, we've talked about. And so in response, CIRA uh, engaged in a consultation process, which CIPIC was, CIPIC was involved in quite, uh, quite extensively, uh, and came up with a new WHOIS policy which was much more interesting, much more nuanced than the old, uh, you know, register and publish policy. And this was a policy that, that was designed to shield personal information for individual rest, registrants, but also, interestingly, for organiza organizations that can show harm by disclosure. And so this is useful for not, mostly nonprofits and charities and, and uh, uh, political organizations that aren't engaged in commercial activity. Those are the kinds of organizations that may have had uh, uh, a privacy interest that fits into the First Amendment uh, view of anonymity uh, that wasn't properly being respected by the old register and publish policy. 
And the default here is kind of what you would expect with a private organization that holds your personal information, which is that you, know, you need a, a warrant. Police would need a warrant for this information or a court order uh, in the case of a civil, um, civil dispute to get access to this information. And things were moving along quite well. We had the draft policy in place. It was scheduled to go in place in 2008. And then there was a changing of the guard at CIRA. The old uh, president of the organization uh, resigned. Uh, the general counsel, who had been pushing this policy, uh, went to uh, Google, God bless him, uh, and uh, some new folk came in who were basically have a corporate background, don't come from uh, civil society, and don't have, uh, at least not to my knowledge, from uh, what I know of these gentlemen, um, kind of a public interest mandate in the, or, you know, or public interest background, uh, much more corporate background. And what resulted was a new knew who was policy. It was just kind of parachuted in at the last minute. And most problematically from our perspective, uh, the new policy has a backdoor. You still have the same non-publication policy as the new policy, but the new new policy says if you claim that you have a dispute with the domain registrant, then CIRA will hand over to you without a warrant or without a court order access in three cases. One, if you're law enforcement and you're pursuing particular kinds of, let's call it cyber crime. It's not crime in general, but it's cyber crime, which is um, interesting. I mean, one of the real problems I have, as you can probably see by the, just from this simple slide, is how we've picked certain areas that we're going to privilege uh, you know, access to this information. So it's not just that you're law enforcement looking for this information, but you're law enforcement uh, searching for a particular um, information with respect to a particular crime. But then the other two areas, uh, much, much, much more controversial, are internet, uh, pardon me, intellectual property claimants and ID theft claimants. And the IP claimants, I mean, it's quite interesting when you read it. We're talking here about people with a registered trademark or a registered copyright or a registered patent uh, or a corporate name or business name. That's the kind of uh, intellectual property interest we're talking about here. So if you have a, a uh, confidential information issue or a trade secret uh, dispute, you have to go uh, get a court order, uh, like all the other schmoes. Um, who's not on this list? It's interesting, again, from, uh, you know, from, uh, from a, a public interest technology law clinic's perspective. When we get involved in these kinds of issues on the other side, usually it's involving um, something, uh, you know, it might be a defamation issue, or it might be a whistleblower case, or, or something like that. Uh, those claimants don't have claims that justify uh, warrantless access, hate crimes investigation, or, or, or um, you know, violations of, uh, of our human rights law, again, don't get privileged access to this information. And the process is, is simple. You just claim to, to CIRA that you have a dispute, capital D, uh, which is a definition that, that identifies the categories that, that uh, we're talking about here, and away you go. No need for an affidavit, no need for a court order. No need for formalities, right? It's just that representation. The other category that, that's in here is ID theft, which is, which is more interesting here. I mean, so the, you'd think that this would mean a consumer, um, you know, trying to protect his or her, his or her um, interests. Really, I mean, and perhaps it won't surprise you if you've done any work in this space. We're talking about uh, insurance companies um, and <coughs> banks who are looking at credit card companies who are going after uh, fraudsters. So interesting choices. Um, the question from, from CIPIC's perspective, again, always is, is this, the, is this the right balance? Have we achieved what the public interest requires here in this selective process, selective disclosure of, of who is information? Okay. Now, the remedy to this and what makes Canada kind of a unique environment from a privacy perspective is PIPIDA, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. I mean, the one thing I'll say, uh, speaking in the United States about this, is you've got to get yourselves one of these. They're really useful. <laughs> <laughs> what Pivot protects is commercial information. Pardon me, commercial information. Personal information in the commercial space. So you've got to, get, you've got to be engaged in commercial activity before Pivot engages. So we're not, it's, not a, it's not a global um, uh, privacy uh, um, law. And we're also talking about personal information. So it's a data uh, it's a data um, law. It's not a general privacy protection standard, uh, statute. Uh, it doesn't create a tort of invasion of privacy or, or anything like that. Uh, but 
you know, even given these limitations, it's actually very effective. The majority of the disputes that come before us fall within, you know, these kind of two um, uh, limitations. And, and so we've actually found PIPEDA very useful in, uh, in working on privacy issues. Now, the general, well, let's talk about some of the highlights of the, of the, of the, uh, of the statute. The general rule here is that you need consent to the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information, and again, in the commercial context. Now, what does consent mean? It is not, and this is so crucial, it's not the contractual standard, right? So I don't know what the, well, actually, I've got, I've got a sense of what the case law in the United States is around uh, consent for the purposes of entering into uh, a, a contract. In Canada, the, the case law is, is uh, very rough on consumers. Uh, recent case law says that just even a hyperlink within a terms of use at the bottom of a commercial website that links out to uh, some kind of policy which you can you know which which the which the organization can change after the contract has been entered into that is still sufficient to bind a consumer to uh, the new obligation in this in a revised uh, internet-based policy statement that's linked into this contract. So this very rough on consumers. So it's essential, it's really crucial from a consumer protection and a privacy protection, protection perspective to get away from the contractual standard of consent. So what does this mean? I mean, when we're talking about consent and, and privacy, usually we're talking about something that's either opt-in or opt-out. There's a sliding standard in PIPEDA based upon the sensitivity of the information for really, you know, the, the, you know, the really personal information, health information, financial information, this kind of, uh, this kind of really sensitive information. Uh, the law is pretty clear now that you need something that's pretty aggressive, that's opt-in. Um, you know, and, and then there's a sliding standard for some other things uh, that really are, are, are less significant. Uh, perhaps uh, if you're, if you're uh, like think about entering into a, a relationship with a bank, um, Opt-in would be required for disclosure to a third party for commercial for a commercial transaction, a commercial dealing. So, if a if a bank wants to partner with an insurance company and wants to give your information to their insurance partner, that's the kind of thing that a consumer would have to opt into. If the bank, however, just wants to give that same information to its department uh, responsible for, um, you know, investments, for example, that would be an opt-out. That's generally where. The, uh, the, the, the case law seems to be going with the view that, you know, when you're tossing information around outside of an organization, that's unexpected. You, consumers should have that brought to their attention, should have the, op the, op the opportunity to say, yeah, I want that. Um, but if you're dealing with the organization and the, uh, the transaction or the, or the dealing is similar, you know, kind of within the, the, the sphere of activities that you would expect uh, when dealing with this organization, that, that an opt-out type mechanism is okay. Uh, and this opt-out can be quite a slide, right? I mean, it can be, you know, a, a check mark on a screen if you're, if you're in an online transaction. It can be a check mark on a form uh, and a paper transaction. Um, it can even be just, you know, you're going to get this service. Send us a letter if you don't want it. You know, it can be that. Uh, so a real interesting sliding standard, very flexible, um, and therefore uh, fairly accommodating to commercial interests who might otherwise oppose this kind of privacy legislation. Now, the Act does have some other very useful components that we'll come back to. One is a refusal to deal, right? If a company demands personal information of you to enter into a transaction, if that information is not reasonably required to provide the services that are being requested, you can't do it. That's a refusal to deal. It's just prohibited by the Act. Similarly, there's an appropriate purposes provision in the Act. The Act is really about transparency and consent, right? Do consumers know what they're getting into, and do they have the, do they have the ability to, uh, to get out of it? Um, in some circumstances, the, uh, the, the law says some purposes just are completely inappropriate and we're not going to go there. So, you know, one area where we expect, uh, we, have, we haven't had the case yet, but we expect, uh, and the, the industry is moving in that, you know, I think agrees with this, is, is dealings with children's personal information, right? You just can't market to young children. You know, the, the, you know, it's just not an appropriate purpose. And that would be an area where um, the, the law would impose kind of a straight line rule where transparency and consent don't cut it. You just can't do it. It's inappropriate. And it's a reasonable purpose standard, or pardon me, reasonable person standard. So again, now turning to think a little bit about um, how organizations deal with personal information. How do, you, how do you comply with the requirements of the act? I mean, the keys really are transparency and openness. To, you know, say what you're doing, make it easy for the consumer to find out how their commercial, how their interest is going to be used in a commercial context, 
what are the dealings, who are, the, who are you disclosing it to, what are the purposes for which you're collecting this information. And safeguards on the back end to make sure that you deal with personal information uh, in a safe fashion. One area in privacy where Canada is well behind the United States is on security breach issues. It's arguably covered in Canada by PIPITA because of an obligation to have appropriate safeguards in place. But uh, we just haven't had great case law uh, to date on it, and I don't think our privacy commissioner has stepped up on the privacy breach cases that have come out and really uh, hammered down um, rules that are equivalent to what we've seen happening in the United States. And I think we're probably going to get a legislative amendment to the Act sometime in the next couple of years that will address that. So let's turn back to who is and, and CIRA uh, in particular. Does CIRA violate PIPITA in its who is policy? We've taken a look at the issue and we're actually, we're, we're pretty certain that it does. We've got three grounds that we're concerned. One is, is on openness. The manner in which CIRA communicates its policies is insufficient to obtain consent. If you go to the CIRA website, they actually have very good materials uh, right up front, and they've improved this over the last couple of years, about who is and about, about uh, their policies and about the exceptions and about the back door. The problem is that you don't go to CIRA to register a domain name. If you're going to register a domain name, you proceed through a registrar. And there's a series of contracts and consents and clicks that you have to go through to get that. And the problem is, to get the who is policy in the hands of the consumer, you have the contractual problem. You have the contractual standard of consent. You don't have the PIPITA standard of consent. And so, particularly given that there are, you know, we all agree that there are significant anonymity issues and anonymity interests that merit some protection. At least some of those consumers, in our view, it's foreseeable, would want to know about what are the terms in which this information is going to be disclosed. This is relevant information because there are third-party services out there that you can, you can uh, retain to help address uh, privacy issues. Um, you know, consumers need to understand whether or not that's going to be sufficient, whether that's going to be needed. Our view is that CIRA just hasn't done enough uh, through its web of contracts and, and the web of, uh, of uh, registration materials a consumer goes through to bring who is to the attention of the ordinary consumer. Second is the unreasonable purposes uh, clause. We've got some concerns about the arbitrary favoring of IP and ID theft claimants in the civil context. Again, why not defamation, why not hate speech claimants? There's, there's, a, there's a public, public policy um, objective here, but the problem is we've picked and chosen, it, it's, it's almost arbitrary, uh, which ones we favored. And if you're going to be favoring some civil litigant claimants over others, there has to be a, you know, a rational connection. It can't, be a, it can't be a product of lobbying power. And I think that's what we have right now in our current backdoor uh, system. You know, the strong lobbyists got the exceptions that they wanted. And it's arbitrary, it's not rational, and it's not defensible under PIPITA. And so we think that there is uh, an unreasonable purpose clause. And finally, we've got the refusal to deal problem, where it just seems pretty clear that uh, you have no choice. You've got to consent to disclosure of your personal information in this manner uh, before you you know, you can register your domain name. It's worth taking a look at 4.3.3. This is the, this is the, 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 the clause that we're, we're talking about. It says that an organization shall not, as a condition of the supply of a product or service, require an individual con to consent to the collection, use, or disclosure of information beyond that required to fulfill the explicitly specified and legitimate purposes. Now again, the issue here is, you know, there may be some legitimacy to, uh, to what's happening, um, but it's not, CIRA's purposes, right? When CIRA is disclosing this information to a third party claimant, it's the third party's, it's the third party's issue. It's the third party's interest. It's not CIRA's interest. CIRA has, CIRA has no stake in the, uh, in, the, in the dispute, and that's the problem. The remedy is nice. It's a complaint. It's a complaint to the Privacy Commission of Canada. It's that easy. It's a letter. Uh, our letters tend to be a little bit more involved, <laughs> a little bit more uh, research, a little bit more fact specific. But the beauty of it is that uh, we don't have to make the case. We have to make the complaint. The Privacy Commissioner then investigates the complaint and determines whether or not it's well-founded and recommends a uh, corrective course of, uh, of action on CIRA's part through the release of a finding. The usual procedure is that after the complaint is filed and the Privacy Commissioner considers whether or not, whether or not it's well-founded, at that point there's an engagement between the Commissioner and the subject of the complaint. Uh, and most, I think the objective of the commissioner is to get uh, every complaint to be, you know, every well-founded complaint 
to be resolved by the time it goes to the finding stage. Um, in exceptional cases, such as the Facebook complaint, which my organization was involved in, in uh, as well, uh, an organization will try and, and, um, and talk tough and not comply by the finding stage, and you get a well-founded and not resolved finding, uh, and that's when the newspapers get very interested. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a, it's a nice system. It's a smooth system. It's very low maintenance from a uh, complainant's perspective, and believe it or not, it's relatively low maintenance from uh, the subject of the complaint's perspective as well, because you're not in court. It's an ombudsperson-like proceeding. So what is the future? Uh, what does the future hold for this? Well, we are working hard on the .ca complaint, and after that, we move on, I think, to the .com, who is, and take a look at whether or not there are improvements to be made in that process, in that policy. And we think that we have uh, a good tool in Canada for addressing international issues where there is a real and substantial connection to Canada. And again, the Facebook complaint, I think, is one such example where we've had an international organization doing business in Canada, subject to Canadian laws, founding, finding themselves running afoul of those laws and changing, changing their policies, changing their practices to comply and doing so on a global basis. So who knows? Maybe Americans don't need a privacy law. You can just borrow ours. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so first thing, I have to start by thanking Ray for setting up my talk so nicely, um, because as he anticipated, I'm going to talk about the tension between trademarks and free speech, or the way that I tend to get at it is the tra tension between um, trademarks and fair use. Um, and Ray sort of gave us the big picture of the tension, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what the tension looks like on the ground from the litigator's perspective. Um, for those of you who don't know who EFF is, it's the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we're a public interest law firm based in San Francisco. And as a member of the IP team uh, at EFF, my practice is pretty much exclusively focused on defending free speech and fair use online against what we always view as completely overreaching uh, intellectual property claims. So I have for a, uh, an IP geek, the best job in the world. And at least a, an IP geek who likes to litigate. And so, but um, until recently, that job actually didn't involve domain names a whole heck of a lot. And so it was funny when Jackie asked me to be on a panel to talk about domain names. I thought, you know, if you asked me a year and a half ago, I would have had almost nothing to say. Um, when I started at EFF a few years ago, I thought of domain names as a little passe from sort of the perspective of someone who's trying to make new law. I mean, who really cares about domain names anymore? Yeah, we got the cyber squatting thing. We've worried about that for a while. Is it really so important anymore? We've got laws in place. Not so much of an issue uh, unless you're a big corporation trying to protect your domain name, which is pretty much the opposite of where I usually sit. So I wasn't that worried about domain names, um, but now, now I am. Um, what we've seen in the past year and a half is uh, a number of situations where companies who don't like what's happening on a website will, rather than confronting the website owner, will go upstream. And sometimes they go upstream to what I call the weakest link, which is the domain name registrar. So to explain why this has become such a problem, let me state something really obvious, which is that so the internet is this great forum for speech. Yay, we all know that. It's wonderful. We're very happy. Everyone can say everything to the world, and that's great. 
Um, but that speech doesn't happen without intermediaries. You, know, you can't just stand on the bench and yell. To the bench that you need to stand on, your soapbox, is web hosting providers and domain name registrars and lots of other upstream providers. And so for someone who doesn't like what you're saying, who thinks that their trademark is being used in what you're saying, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the easiest thing for them to do is to go upstream to one of those providers, not confront you, but confront someone else and get them to shut you off uh, in one way or another. And it used to be that we would see that just go, people would mostly would just go to web hosting services. Um, but that now that's not happening so much. Um, another thing too, just as a backup, is what we also used to see is much more the use of copyright to shut people down. Using the Digital Millennium Copyright Act procedure, people send a takedown notice, it's very easy. Um, but it's also easy or relatively easy to send a counter notice and get your speech put back up. So if you've got a video on YouTube or something like that. That was what we were seeing a lot of until recently. But now we're seeing more use of trademark claims. Um, and again, as I'm going to talk about today, going not just to the web host, but going to the um, domain name registrar. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, this is a case that I was involved in um, um, earlier this year, in February. So I, if, if you haven't heard about this, this was a spoof website that was put up in conjunction with um, a really fantastic spoof that involved a whole bunch of different activists, including a group I represent called the Yes Men, um, where they made a parody New York Times, and they handed it out all around the country, and then they also made this great website, um, which, if you, I don't know if you look at the New York Times website, but it looks a lot like this. Um, but they, you know, the, the headlines are very different. Iraq war ends, Bush is impeached, um, other nice things. Sorry, it doesn't really come through really well, but um, the, the Rumsfeld apologizes for the WMD scare. So sorry, oops. Um, nice, nice 300,000 troops never faced a risk of instant obliteration. He National health insurance passes, yay. Um, this is all what's supposed to have happened by July 4th, 2009. Well, didn't happen, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so the, the domain name for the site is um, New York Times-SE, New York Times Special Edition. That's what the SE stands for, dot com. So you'd think, huh, I wonder if it's the New York Times that went to the registrar. That's probably what you're all thinking, but you'd be wrong. Instead, the website included um, a number of advertisements spoof advertisements that were almost as funny as the content, actually sometimes funnier than the content itself. This was one of them. This was talking about De Beers. Oops, sorry. Hey, why aren't you working? Oh, damn. Oh, well, okay. Well, I thought this was going to work, but it is not going to. So I'll just tell you what it did. <laughs> it says, your purchase of a diamond will enable us to donate a prosthetic for an African whose hand was lost in the diamond conflicts. And I really wish you could see this. I'm so sad that it's not working. It worked a minute ago. But there was an animation that said, you know it, we know it. And there was sort of the hands coming together. I don't know if you've seen the De Beers ads where the hands come together and the diamond flashes. Well, this was a a prosthetic hand, <laughs> and I, it's so sad you can't see this, it was very funny. Um, well, I, see, you think it's funny. And the little tagline down there is from her fingers <laughs> to his. Um, so funny, right? Except for if you're De Beers, not, not funny. Not funny at all, they did not think it was funny. <laughs> so what did they do? Well, they sent a threat letter to the strangest person of all in the whole picture, which is Joker.com, who's a Swiss-based um, registration service that register the domain name. And they said, you know, all kinds of threat disparagement, trademark infringement, we, we're coming after you immediately if you don't take this down. So Joker says, oh, huh, what, I don't, what's going on? We don't know, we don't track these things. They're a registrar. They don't even look at what's on their sites. And they're not supposed to under US law anyway. Um, so they send a note to my clients and say, you got two oh. weeks to deal with this. In the meantime, the, the site was locked. Um, you've got two weeks to deal with this, and you know if you let us know it's resolved, then we'll be fine. Okay. So my clients are really lucky because they actually have lawyers. Uh, lots of people who get these kinds of um, letters don't have lawyers, which is something I'm going to come back to. So um, they called us, and we looked at it for like three seconds and saw all kinds of obvious defenses. So we wrote a letter to um, to Joker, explaining. Or, sorry, we wrote a letter to De Beers and CC Joker explaining 
this is uh, silly. So why is it silly? I just want to hit this, hit the defenses that were obvious to us, first of all. And in case not all of you are trademark lawyers, I'll just talk about what they are. So the first, the first thing is completely non-commercial use. There was no commercial activity related to this. And courts in the United States have recognized that if there's no commercial use, essentially the Lanham Act doesn't apply. Now there's some wiggle room here. Some courts, erroneously in my opinion, have suggested if there's any fundraising, maybe that counts as commercial use. So it's not perfect, but there's strong protections here. And at any rate, for this site, there was no fundraising, there was no t-shirts being sold, nothing, nothing, right? So that's easy, right? Lanham Act, out. <laughs> Um, even if that didn't work, uh, nominative fair use. Very easy nominative fair use. Claim they used the mark. Um, they needed to use the mark in order to make fun of said corporation. This is one of the best ways in which trademark law tries to deal with the tension between free speech and trademarks. Um, they used a lot of De Beers copy, but actually not that much of their marks, but they only used what they needed for the parody. So that's easy. And no one in the world is going to think that De Beers sponsored or endorsed this ad. So also, easy, easy. And then if you didn't have that, you'd always have the First Amendment balancing test, right? Which says that another way in which you mediate the tension between trademarks and free speech, um, we've got many cases that say Lanham Act applies to artistic works only where the public interest in avoiding confusion outweighs the public interest in free expression. Here, I think we'd have a pretty strong case particularly given the political content of the expression that we win the First Amendment balancing test as well. So, very easy stuff. And then if we didn't have all of that, Joker can't be held liable anyway, right? Because there are, again, it can always be revisited. You never know what a court's gonna do, but we've got strong case law in the United States again that says that domain name registrars can't be held liable for content on a website. So. All good. And again, remember the basic thing. What's De Beers doing complaining to a domain name registrar? Its name isn't in the domain. So it doesn't have, which is why they probably didn't try the UDRP, which I'll talk about in a second. So <clears throat> any trademark lawyer would look at the site and come up with this in five minutes, probably. Maybe 10. I don't know what they mostly spend their time doing, but couldn't be that hard, right? Um, oh, and there's also De Beers' alleged defamation. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act protects um, the, the service providers like this from uh, liability for defamation. So, so protected. Joker has nothing to fear. So what are they doing even passing this on? Why don't they just tell De Beers to go hang? Well, that's the problem. Joker has very little incentive to do that. There's two problems, actually. Joker is also Swiss-based, but even if they were a U.S. company, we have a problem with trademarks. Um, now, I'm no fan of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for the most part, but the one decent thing that it does have is it does have some kind of counter notice procedure, right? So you can send a notice, you can send a counter notice. The service provider, as long as it follows the procedures, knows that it's out, right? It's got protections, unless you're YouTube and you get sued anyway, but most people get protections. Um, so that's great, but we don't have that for trademarks. For a service provider, including registrars, Thinking about the law, that 10 minutes, that costs money. And even if you write on the law, someone might sue you just because they're crazy or whatever, and that costs money. So that equals risk. Let me just break that down. So let's say you had to pay a lawyer to think about that whether the domain name is defensible. Let's say 100 bucks. Um, having a lawyer write a letter back, 500 bucks, I mean, let's face it, we're expensive. Well, I'm not, but most of, most of you guys are. Um, cost of litigating that question, if you have a crazy person on the other side, who knows, right? Thousands of dollars. Okay, now the income you get from that domain name, not very much, right? If you offer a super, super duper premium, the most premium service I could find was $35 a year. So, you know, it just does not work out for you. So that's a problem, and it's a problem that I'm seeing more and more of. And apparently it's a problem that uh, trademark owners are hip to. Um, what I'm, I've sort of come up with, I think of as the takedown toolkit. So the first way of, for someone to sort of exploit this weakest link is they send a cease and desist letter or even just an email, right? Because they know that it's not in the registrar's interest to do anything about it other than make trouble for the registrant. Another thing they can do is they can pursue a complaint in front of the uniform, uh, uh, via the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy. 
Um, and also they can seek legal process. Now I see that I'm running late, so I'm going to try to be quick through these. So first you can do a UDRP process. UDRP process is very easy for trademark owners who have lawyers. It is not so very easy for a layperson. So it's pretty simple. You file a complaint with an international arbitrator, explain how the domain name is confusingly similar to your mark, how the registrant doesn't have a legitimate interest, how they must have registered it in bad faith, registrants notified, domain service notified, 20 days to respond, panel, uh, uh, an arbitrator is appointed to resolve it. It could be one to three. It's usually just one person. Get a decision in two weeks. And then, thank goodness, there is a fallback. Um, if you lose, the registrant has 10 days to seek judicial review in a court of mutual jurisdiction. So that's good. That's the one sort of fail safe. Um, because unfortunately, the problem with the UDRP proceeding procedure is it's got a few fundamental flaws. Um, first of all, it's an international proceeding. And there's no requirement for arbitrators to respect US protections in US law. So the First Amendment doesn't necessarily exist for you. Um, the one limit on that that's emerged over the past um, few years is that there seems to be a consensus that's growing that if you have, you're talking about US registrants, and it, basically if all the parties are in the United States, US law should apply. So that's some, that's some help. Of course, it's also true that EDRP arbitrators have no obligation to follow precedent. So, you know, it's a very uh, uh, uncertain process. Tends to favor repeat players at a minimum because repeat players know how it works and can respond quickly. Um, regular folks, if they can't get a free lawyer like me, are going to have a hard time um, intervening. And of course, it's going to be likely that if you're the kind of user that I tend to represent, a free speech kind of user, you're usually a nonprofit, you're a non commercial user, you don't have any money, right, to pay lawyers to respond. Um, so it's a problem. And also, if you try to respond yourself, it's really not so easy. I mean, actually, having read some of the communications from the WIPO folks, it's, it's just a language issue. Sometimes it is really hard to follow what you're supposed to do. Um, and it's very fast, and it takes a while for people to get lawyers. Um, and it's going to get even faster next year. There's a new fast track option that's um, being contemplated. OK, so let me show how this is going to play out. Um, this can't see it that well, but this was a dispute I handled last week, or I'm sorry, not last week, uh, around Christmas. There's a company called uh, Union Square Partnership. They do, um, we work on developing the Union Square area in New York. Um, a lot of people don't like the development. So some of those people who didn't like the development did a little spoof site. And you can't see it too well, I'm sorry about that, but you'll see it looks very similar to the original site, uh, which is deliberate. Um, but the language is very different. So there's a little picture of, instead of like pretty pictures of the beautiful um, park with the snow and the farmer's market and isn't that nice, there's pictures of trees being torn down, and which is what they did. And then the little pictures here show like there's a little squirrel saying, my park is not for sale. And, uh, and the text of it is, is very, very different. I'm very sarcastic. Why are you cutting down 80-year-old trees? Union Square Partnership, evil, et cetera. OK. Um, so if anyone looks at it for a second, they're going to see that this is not Union Square Partnership. But the domain name for it was unionsquarepartnership.org. So Union Square Partnership did a number of things. First, they filed a completely bogus copyright claim, but I won't talk about that here. Um, but the other thing they did is they started a UDRP proceeding. And we went, and we um, defended it there. And we talked about you know, thinking about the domain name in conjunction with the site. We talked about all the different protections, which are the same ones I talked about just now, of non-commercial use and First Amendment balancing and so on. And the arbitrator said, yeah, that's very nice, but I don't think so. Um, so we were getting all ready to go to um, appeal it in front of a court. Fortunately, we didn't have to. It got, it got settled. But in the meantime, this site was shut down all through the Christmas marketing season, which was important for the speech that they were trying to engage in and sort of held back a lot of the organizing activities that they were trying to um, encourage through this site. Um, here's another example. Um, this is one where we didn't have all US entities. So that was a problem. This was a. Um, site called accompanyreport.com, um, which was basically a new site about a new drug, Accomplia, which is like this miracle drug that's going to help you stop smoking and lose weight. It's like the best drug ever, um, only 
um, it's not on the market yet, damn. But um, so um, a new a journalist set up a site just with just stuff about Accomplia. He knew that people would be interested in it. Synovia so Ventus was not happy about it. They again launched a UDRP proceeding. We got an international arbitrator. We lost. We were about to go to court. Unfortunately, we were able to resolve it by adding this. This is a recent version of it. This neither affiliated with nor endorsed by Synovia Ventus. Disclaimer. But again, you ask me, this had tons of protections, except for that there was commercial use. But other than that, we had no problem under the First Amendment on basic free speech and nominative fair use principles. We would have won in a US court. <coughs> OK, so that's the UDRP process. Um, the one good thing about the UDRP process is there, are good, there is good news. Um, this is a case that came out last week, which I'm really excited about. Um, the, there's a domain name called Glenn Beck Raped and Murdered a Young Girl in 1990.com. And this um, website, it was designed to sort of pick up on an internet meme, meme where people were trying to make fun of Glenn Beck because Glenn Beck was participating in the whole birther movement and saying, why won't Obama deny the allegations that he was born in Zimbabwe? Or actually, I'm, I forget where he was supposed to be born, but anyway, not in the United States. Um, and he does, Glenn Beck does this in other ways. So some people started talking about, okay, well, why won't Glenn Beck deny that he raped and murdered a young girl in 1990? The idea was to sort of, you know, challenge Glenn Beck's approach to politics. Um, and I'm sorry, the site's not up anymore, so I can't show you, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But um, so it's, um, it's just like, we're not accusing Glenn Beck of raping and murdering a young girl, but we can't help but wonder, why doesn't he deny these terrible allegations? Um, and at the bottom, it had a clear disclaimer. This is parody satire. We assume Glenn Beck did not rape and mur murder a young girl in 1990, although we haven't seen proof, um, et cetera. So they got a US-based arbitrator. And the US-based arbitrator said, yeah, I'm with you. And she did a couple different things. First of all, she made sure to look at the domain name in combination with the website, which is not always what happens and what should happen. Um, and says, this is political speech protected by the First Amendment. I'm applying US law, as you can tell. Um, the respondent is making a political statement. This is the legitimate non-commercial use of the mark, nominative fair use, everything you want, right? All there. That's great. So the UDRP can work out OK. Um, this guy was represented by a very funny and very clever counsel, um, a guy named Mark Randaza, who wrote really funny briefs, but, but good ones, and got them to, um, to apply US law. Now, this is why I can't show you the site. Right after he won in the UDRP, he wrote a letter to Glenn Beck and said, you know what, I was just trying to protect the First Amendment here. Now that that's clear that you have no claim, I don't need this little scrap of digital real estate anymore. And he transferred it over to Glenn Beck, and that's why the site's not up anymore. Because um, Glenn Beck still doesn't think it's funny. <laughs> um, OK, let me close by t touching on um, a couple, or almost close, <coughs> by touching on the, the worst way that this can go down. I know I'm running late. I'm sorry. <coughs> um, two cases that happened, one that's still ongoing, one that happened last year. Um, this is when you use legal process. And this part is when registrars most particularly cave. Um, the WikiLeaks situation, WikiLeaks is a site that hosts sort of whistleblower documents. And it hosted some documents that reflected, that seemed to reflect financial wrongdoing by a Swiss bank, Julius Baer. Julius Baer, not happy. No sense of humor, no sense of willingness to be criticized. Um, well, I guess they weren't funny, actually. But anyway, so they sued the domain name registrar, Dynadot. Dynadot immediately caved. What? We'd have to pay lawyers? Are you kidding me? We don't want to do this. We're being sued. This is terrible. So makes a deal with Julius Baer to lock and permanently disable the site, submits the settlement agreement to the court, court approves it, all happens really fast. So everyone goes a little crazy um, as soon as they get wind of this. But it happens almost before anyone can get wind of it. So a, a ton of amicus briefs were filed with the court. The court said, oh my goodness, I had no idea what I was, what I was doing. Sorry. Um, we filed, ACLU filed, a number of media organizations, all kinds of people filed and said, you cannot do this. This is completely wrong. And so the agreement was ultimately dissolved. But again, only after a bunch of people got involved. And meanwhile, the site was temporarily locked. Um, so that's sort of one way you can do it. Um, another thing, another case that's still ongoing, the state of Kentucky uh, attempted to seize 141 
uh, domain names that it said were gambling devices under Kentucky law. Well, a number of these sites had nothing to do with Kentucky. It's very unclear that Kentucky, a Kentucky state court had any jurisdiction over these sites whatsoever. But nonetheless, the court ordered the names transferred to the state, and a number of the registrars, including GoDaddy, which is one of the largest registrars, um, locked the domain names and transferred control to the state. Now again, that order was appealed. We were involved in this. Um, it was overturned, but now Kentucky is appealing to the Supreme Court. That was argued two weeks ago. We don't have a decision yet. Um, so again, there's all these different places in which you think like the domain name is the least related to the site of anybody. But by going to this weak link, um, you can get a lot done. Um, all these cases that I told you, you know, lawyers got involved. So ultimately, you had good outcomes for the most part. But a lot of people can't afford to pay counsel. There aren't a lot of free public interest uh, intellectual property lawyers in the country. Um, there aren't that many at all, believe me. And we can't take all these cases. So it's, it's a real problem. Um, so usually, to be honest, I tell people to try to avoid complaints in the first place. And what can you do? You can be non-commercial. You can try not to use a mark alone in a domain name. You can have a disclaimer. Uh, most, one of the most important things you can do is you can find a service provider with backbone. Frankly, I don't know any domain name registration services that I would say had backbone. But if you've got a web host that cares about your issues, they're going to push back against their <laughs> upstream providers, and that can help you. Um, there are also technical shenanigans that they can do, which I won't get into. Um, don't borrow more than you need from us, anyone that you're trying to parody. And please, 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 if a company contacts you and complains about your domain name, which again, they won't, because they're going to go to your upstream provider now, but let's say they do, do not offer to sell your domain name for anything, because then you're going to look like a cyber squatter, and you're really going to look bad when they UDRP you. The other thing you could do is donate to the EFF. But I'll, <laughs> I'll say no more about that. Thank you. If it's okay, we'll go just a bit over. We'll take about five minutes of uh, questions uh, for our panel. Um, I guess I, I'd like to start with David and ask, uh, you know, the, the web was supposed to be the leveler uh, so that there would be no geographic or political boundaries among nations. How does PIPIA apply outside Canada, or when might it? What's the extraterritorial effect? Yeah, it's, it's, this, it's the general... Uh, principle of, of when does a court have jurisdiction over a dispute, right? In Canada, the rule is, are there real and substantial connections between the dispute and Canada? And where there are, uh, the court will take, uh, will take jurisdiction. So the Facebook case is a great example where you've got an American corporation that was nonetheless very much present in Canada, had something like, I don't know, 10 million Canadian registrants. Uh, and so Facebook seri didn't seriously dispute that the Federal Privacy Commissioner had jurisdiction to go after. Um, to go after Facebook, and so you know, we anticipate the same thing would happen with, uh, you know, with uh, any domain name that had Canadian a significant volume of Canadian registrants. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, three points. First, across the board, please don't conflate the internet with the web. They're different things. Web is a tiny piece of the internet. And to your point about domain names and web content, well, a lot of domain names are being used for far things other than what uses the web. Uh, but jumping into the point about who is, uh, as far as the history goes, it started out essentially as a club roster. In 1972, we had the internet, um, the, the internet, the um, handbook, and had all our names listed. And we essentially knew each other. It was a skinny little book. Uh, it just grew from that. So it's just basically an historical inertia. No, no rationale behind it whatsoever, other than we knew each other back then. And the third thing is, again, with respect to who is, there's what's called the um, Emily Post option with regard to who is, which is, it's, um, the, the, the Kafka's trial begins with some sort of statement about uh, Joseph K. was arrested because somebody was telling lies about him. Well, it's usually a good idea who, to know who's asking questions about you. So the, the Emily Post option for who is, is if someone is essentially accusing you by looking at your record, they should leave a calling card saying who they are, proof of their identity. It should also make an, a clear accusation about why in the world they're looking. 
uh, and this will be recorded, so it could be used against them if they go beyond that, and any supporting re reasons to make this accusation. And this would be published to the domain name registrant, and the fact of the query, not necessarily the details, but the person asking the question would be recorded in a public gazette so that someone could look later and say, oh, this law firm has made 100,000 inquiries to who it is. You could find out who essentially people are trying to abuse the system. That creates kind of a balancing pressure. Yeah, all good proposals. Um, at the very least, we've argued that you need, uh, you know, if you're if you're alleging a dispute, you need to attest to it, or you need to swear out an affidavit or something, so that um, you know if you lie or misrepresent uh, the truth, uh, that there are some con there are at least consequences, or potential for consequences for that uh, for that statement. Um, just a comment on that. One of the problems that we've seen in the, in the DMCA context with complaints about um, videos in particular is that uh, until relatively recently, uh, companies like YouTube would take stuff down and it, it would actually be quite difficult to figure out and take quite a flurry of activity to figure out who was complaining about your video, which kind of matters in terms of deciding whether to counter notice, because you might be using a number of people's works in, in your mashup or, or whatever, and you would want to know who's actually complaining so that you can decide whether the particular use that you made of that person's work was a fair use that you wanted to fight about or not. Um, recently, YouTube, or in the past year, YouTube now has a policy um, where they will say who's made the complaint. But they didn't used to, and a lot of services still don't. So you can just find your stuff taken down, and you don't know why. You don't know who complained. It's hard to actually get the complaining notice in the first place. Um, so it's, it's a problem in, in other contexts as well, just sort of essentially anonymous complaints. Yes. Changing of the, the um, search engines, they're finding content independent pretty much of uh, I'm thinking more and more independent of the actual domain name. Is it necessary to have DeBeersReport.com? I mean, if you had the Glenn Beck site that you just cited there, I can't think that they thought they were going to successfully say that someone's confusing this with Glenn Beck when you have that extremely long name, when you bury that within some long domain. Or really, you don't even need to put Glenn Beck in the domain name. Uh, for parity and First Amendment issues in those types of sites, wouldn't they be better off not using the trademark within the domain name and having the, having the, the web crawlers find them otherwise? Um, it is true that these days you don't need to always use the, domain, uh, the trademark in, in the domain name. Sometimes I, I think you kind of do, especially when part of your parity, like for the New York Times situation, that partly worked because it was New York Times SE. I mean, it was sort of the, the whole thing was for you to sort of come to it. I mean, people who actually, when they went to it, would already know because of how you got to it that it was a parody site anyway. But, but nonetheless, um, the domain name is sort of part of the whole parody. It's a whole spoof of the newspaper. So you need it to, to be um, as similar looking as possible, including um, having that, that trademark. So I think you're right that if you don't need it for purposes of your what you're engaged in, it's probably easiest and safest to leave it out. But as we saw with the De Beers situation, that's not going to keep someone from making a complaint um, if, if they decide that that's the, the fastest thing to do and the easiest way to make trouble for you. Well, and, and from a First Amendment perspective, I mean, the free speech doctrine has always been skeptical of saying, well, you can make a similar message or reach a potentially similar audience just by changing uh, how you convey that message, whether it's by providing your identity uh, and therefore lose your anonymity, or in you know the famous Cohen case, right, to say, well, I, I seriously resist uh, the draft that I'm opposed to the draft. Right? So the choice of how we convey our information outside of the trademark context is generally left to the, the, the writer, uh, the speaker. Yes, sir. Uh, two comments. Um, first, uh, for Corinne. Um, I have been seeing little teasers, little nibbles about domain name registrars um, having their own uh, policies for doing takedowns of their customers. Um, and I've never really seen that coordinated or organized in any fashion. I think there may be more that we want to take a look at in that area to try and get a sense of just how prevalent is it. Um, I, domain name registrars should be, as you have portrayed them, and as I would agree, completely passive in this process. All they do is provide a domain name and they get out of the way. And I don't think that's what's going on. I, I, I haven't organized my thoughts on that well enough to point it out, but I, I am worried about that. Um, let me, a comment for um, David. Um, 
In the US, uh, the way that we've been addressing domain name uh, registrant anonymity is through domain name proxy services. Um, but uh, we're seeing some real pressure put on the domain name proxy services um, after at least two cases I can point to. Uh, one recently involving can spam saying that uh, if you use a domain name proxy service, that could be an enhancement under a can spam uh, punishment. But more importantly, the uh, name cheap case that suggested that using that the domain name proxy could be a contributory cyber squatter if um, uh, if the uh, name was used in cyber squatting. So I'd simply point out that um, we have a system here in the U.S. It may be putting under pressure. So you may actually have come up with a better solution. Yeah, just one quick response. We do have the same same services available in Canada, uh, just because they provide a greater layer of protection than. Uh, you know, than uh, relying upon the, the who is policy. And also because there's a certain amount of, uh, as you can see, uncertainty about Syria's commitment to, to privacy. Um, and so, you know, those, those options are always available. Uh, we have similar concerns in Canada about whether or not there are, are um, legal concerns around what these guys, what, what these companies do. We're just, we're only now finally getting around to enacting any spam, any spyware, any phishing uh, legislation. And that's one of the things that's kind of been rumbling around in the background. Because uh, we think these services, by and large, are good services, uh, provided they're responsive to legal process and, and, and otherwise, uh, you know, abiding by the terms of the various agreements <laughs> between CIRA and, uh, well, among CIRA registrants and registrars. We have time for one, one more question. Yes, sir. Actually, it's, it's two. But two questions. <laughs> one, 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 one for each. David, you mentioned that um, CIRA has no stake in whether or not they turn over the information. Is that because they are, they enjoy the same limited immunities that US-based registrars and registries do? In essence, they can't be sued. Is that why they have no stake? Yes, though I would really qualify that by saying that we don't act, we've always just operated on the assumption that that is what would happen if they ever got sued. They've never been sued. They've never been threatened. Um, but, but, they could, but they could be. But they could be. It's just never happened. And uh, the consensus is, based upon where the Supreme Court of Canada has gone in the copyright sphere, whenever these issues arise, uh, they've generally conferred pretty significant immunity uh, on these organizations. And from a policy perspective, uh, Industry Canada has been pretty clear, uh, stating that they don't want blanket liability on these kinds of service providers. And so if, you know, if De Beers did come to Canada and go after CIRA, for example, I think there would be a very, sp very fast legislative response. Uh, so smaller country, sometimes we have to assume some policies are in place. And Gordon, was the, was the uh, spoofer's mistake choosing uh, a European-based registrar? Was that the initial mistake that they assumed an extraterritorial application of the First Amendment into a jurisdiction that doesn't have the same sort of view of free speech that we do? Well, I'd like to say that if you picked a U.S. registrar, you would be fine. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think that that's true. Um, it, it, it is true that if you pick a U.S. registrar, it, it's, there isn't going to be any question about all of these protections. And so that's going to make the uh, snarky letter that I write back uh, stronger. But, um, but the, um, so, so choosing a European registrar can, can put you in a weaker position, I think, legally, just because you don't know what's going to end up being applied for sure. Um, I still think you have a strong case that you should apply anyway. But, but that jurisdictional question aside, again, we're talking about all these sort of informal things that go on. And informally, the registrar, a U.S. registrar, just like a European registrar, has unfortunately the same set of incentives about how, you know, whether it wants to spend any money to think about whether it should spend, you know, any other money on lawyers. <laughs> Basically, do they want to pay their lawyers to think about whether the, the trademark's defensible or not, um, and whether they want to get into it writing a letter back, or is it easier just to, you know, comply? And, and because it's only $6 a year to them, and it's just not that much money. Good questions. It's time now for a break. Please join me in thanking the panel for their comments. Oh, that's all right. Don't worry. Mine's totally different. I want that bumper sticker.